All right. Today is Tuesday, February 14th. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Happy Valentine's Day. Love you all. And apologies for the absence last night. Could not be avoided. But the good news is I got a packed show for you tonight. And let's start by this. You know, last year, it has been the year of the bear. But it was a boring year. And the reason is there was no challenge. There was no pushback from the bullish side. There was no debate. There was no back and forth. Every time the bulls fought back, they lost and we knew that they were going to lose. But this year, we have a challenge. We have a slugfest of opinions on where the economy is going to head and therefore where the stock market will head. In the debate between the bull and the bear, the conversation became really toxic. Matter of fact, more toxic than the Ohio River. By the way, the biggest ecological disaster in recent American history. And of course, your beloved media was not even covering the story until folks got mad on Twitter and then it got some coverage. But anyways, we talk about the bullish argument all in all. It's an argument based on two different destinations. Destination number one, a horrific economy dipping into a recession, which will cause the Fed to backtrack and pivot and start cutting rates and re-stimulate the economy. That is the pivot way, the pivot argument by the bulls. Now, argument number two goes as the following. Oh, the economy is actually really strong and the consumer is resilient. And therefore, it doesn't matter if the Fed is going to raise interest rates. Inflation will get hit, but the economy will be spared. And therefore, we're going to have a soft landing. Now, the pivot argument was the catalyst behind last summer's rally. The famous bear market rally that lasted from July all the way to August. And the reason behind that bear market rally is the fact that the pivot optimism, the pivot argument, started to gain some ground. Based on what? Based on a decline month over month in the CPI inflation rate for the month of July. That argument did not last too long because Jerome Powell came out of Jackson Hole really hawkish, saying that we're going to see more pain in the economy, that inflation is way too high. And immediately, all of these uh, pivot hopes and dreams Dreams went down the toilet right away. Yet the bulls kept hanging on that at some point, because we continue to get more data suggesting that the economy is worsening, that at some point the Fed is going to pivot, that perhaps the Fed is bluffing. And when they realize that the economy is getting damaged severely, they will backtrack, pause interest rate hikes, and perhaps pivot into cutting. In the aftermath of cooling inflation readings in November, December, and January, we saw the revival of the pivot optimism that perhaps inflation is going down and the economy is weak enough and therefore the Fed is going to pivot after all. And with cooling inflation data, this argument gained a lot of ground. On top of that, when we started to get more data that the labor market is not getting damaged, the other bullish argument also gained a lot of ground, which is maybe the Fed is going to hike, go as high as they want, inflation goes down, but the economy is not going to be damaged. And therefore, both arguments gained ground this year. Both ways were valid for the bulls. And you wonder why we have an insane stock market rally? We have mechanical reasons behind it, of course. But without the validity of the argument, be it pivot or soft landing, we would have never seen such inflows and stampede into buying equities. Here's the problem. The door for both arguments is now being slowly shut once again. When it comes to the pivot argument, it is no longer valid. And the reason is we got a hot employment report from last month, which means if you think uh, the Fed is going to cut interest rates because the economy is weakening out of empathy, of course, that's not going to happen anymore. And that leaves one argument alive, which is the soft landing. The bulls have all of their eggs in this basket now that we're getting better economic data, yet inflation continues to weaken. And therefore, we got a soft landing. And it doesn't matter how long and how high the Fed will go. And folks, while the pivot argument was the catalyst behind the last bear market rally last summer, the soft landing argument is the catalyst behind this year's rally. Whether you want to call it a bull market rally, a bear market rally, doesn't matter to me. It is all valid until it's not. And therefore, we see the divorce between the bond and the equities market. The bond market is now saying higher rates to come. But the equities market is not deterred at all because it says, who cares about how high interest rates will go? It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, inflation will get hit but the economy will stay strong. But here's the problem. This argument got hit today because we got a CPI report, inflation report, and it came out harder than expectations. 
indicating a revival, a rebound in inflation. But still, the bulls are not deterred. They believe that the soft landing narrative is still here, still valid, and the reason is, well, the economy is not being damaged. And all in all, we're not seeing a major pop in the rebound in inflation. And now we're hearing all of this narrative about, oh, the bear market is over. Wells Fargo already said that the bear market is over. We have a new bull market ahead of us. We have bears capitulating live on TV, such as Steve Weiss, of course. Absolute embarrassment. But here's the problem for the soft landing argument. There is an element of bluff because even the most bulls of bulls, they understand that if rates go too high, equities valuations will have to go down. And we also have a lag impact. So the higher rates go, the more damage the economy will have to endure. Of course, stagflation, which what I believe the economy is facing right now and will continue to face, kills both the pivot and the soft landing hopes together because it gives us higher inflation, sticky inflation, and a weakening economy. And for me, the evidence is clear. We see inflation sticky. We see more and more layoffs, more and more weakening in the economy step by step. But until that becomes clear to the bulls, this element of bluff if it's called out, could shake the bull's confidence in the soft landing narrative. What could do that? The answer is if rates blast significantly higher, but most importantly, if the dollar blasts significantly higher. Now, the dollar moves higher based on more tightening of the monetary policy. And if the dollar expects the Fed to tighten more because we're getting more inflationary data in the economy, then the dollar is going to pop higher. Was the CPI good enough for the dollar to pop higher today? The answer is not quite, because yes, we have a rebound in inflation, but not strong enough to make that move. Look at the correlation between the Dixie, the dollar index, and the Qs, the Nasdaq today. The algorithms have been programmed to track the dollar tick by tick. If the dollar ticks higher, the Qs ticks down. If the dollar ticks down, the Qs blasts higher. You can see the correlation right in front of you. Of course, with the Qs exaggerating the moves. What is the danger of that? The danger is that the currency market could move erratically based on macroeconomic news. And if the algos are wired to track the dollar, let's say we get a piece of macro news that forces short covering in the dollar. The algorithmic reaction of that could be an oversized move in the indices because algos should not be tracking one chart only. But this is the case and the evidence is clear. What do we have tomorrow? We have retail sales. And I talked about this on Discord today. What I'm hearing is warmer weather and aggregate demand kicking in. Retail sales will smash all expectations. And I will show you what Bank of America says in the in-focus segment. But if that is the case, could a hotter than expected, way hotter than expected retail sales data in the month of January be the catalyst for the dollar to pop higher out of the consolidation range? And if that is the case, could it also be the catalyst for a big down move in the indices tomorrow. This is something you gotta watch for. But for now, before we move on to the in focus segment, let's do a segment we call Fed Zombie Alert. Now, the first piece of news from Zombieland is, and it was expected, of course, we have Governor, or excuse me, Vice Chair Braindead, well, she's no longer Vice Chair, because she accepted a position in the Biden administration to be the top economic advisor. Now, I have no idea why would she uh, accept such a downgrade from Vice Chair to a government propagandist, but to each his own. The point of Braindead leaving is the doves will lose a major ally in the Fed. Braindead is the most dovish Fed member ever. She's a radical to begin with. Just read her academic papers. She believes in MMT, endless printing, no need to worry about inflation at all. And the Fed's priorities should be uh, climate and uh, racial this, woman that. But I say good luck to Mrs. Brain Dead and her endeavors. Who cares? And then we got a tweet from the ECB. You know that worldwide we have a credibility problem for central banks. When they talk tough and say we're going to drive inflation down to the 2% target. No bargaining at all. And the market says, now why? Watch this, right? You're bluffing. Nobody believes what you say. And to restore this credibility, the ECB today tweeted that roses are red, violets are blue. We will stay the course and return inflation to two. That will do it, right? Now everybody's scared. Now everybody believes the ECB and the Federal Reserve. What a joke. And then we have from the Dallas Fed, Lori Logan. This is the new president replacing a drunk insider trader, Bob Kaplan. She's also talking hawkish now, like the rest of them, saying the most important risk facing central bankers is that we tighten too little. And then, of course, we got Barkin from Richmond, and he said today that the central bank may need to raise interest rates to a higher level than previously anticipated should inflation keep running too fast for comfort. Or oh, really, you think? And here's another zombie from Philly, Harker. 
He says that he backs raising interest rates above 5%, but he says that we're also close to the restrictive rate. Dude, what are you talking about? How stupid can you be? Anyways, and he favors a 25 basis points increments. But folks, it all comes down to the macroeconomics data. And the most important one we got today is the CPI, aka the CPI. And immediately, we knew that it's going to be bad, indicating rebounding inflation, even though the cooks at the bureau will tune down the magnitude of the rebound. Therefore, before even the report was out, you got corporate tools and propagandists such as uh, Paul Krugman, who says that the inflation report could show a significant uptick, but it would not tell us much about the economy's long-term health. You gotta go to the doctor for that. But I'll show you what the health of the economy really is in reviewing the CPLI. And here it is, in Focus Tonight. Let's review the CP Live with a new formula, aka the ingredient. Now the headline reads, inflation rose half a percentage point in January, more than expected and up 6.4% from a year ago. We have a disinflation process in the economy, folks. What are you talking about? And of course, everybody was talking about, ah, oh, you can't look at the CPI as a whole. You got to look at the CPI X something. Core CPI services X shelter, for example, continues to move higher. CPI X goods continues to go higher or co goes down, who knows. Core inflation X housing does this and that. CPI services X rent. Core CPI inflation X ketchup. And it goes on and on and on. They want to take something out and look at it different ways. Is it going higher? Is it going down? Who cares, folks? Inflation all in all is moving higher. We know that in real life. And I say, how about CPI X everything? That's what the propagandists want. Because in reality, whether you look at inflation X this and X that, we will look at the annualized change, be it the 12 month, be it the 6 month, be it the 3 month, all rebounding higher. And they're all uh, sticky. That's the key word, sticky. And even when we look at the CPI X nothing, it's also sticky. It's also rebounding higher. And we look at it now, we'll last rate, be it six month or three. Doesn't matter. But of course, the most important thing we look at is the month over month increase or decrease by category. When we do that, look at this. Barely any categories went down month over month. You have utilities, gas services. You look at the manipulated Henry Hub futures. That's damn big. Yet month over month, natural gas is up 6.7%. Gasoline rebounding up 2.4%. Medical care commodities up 1.1% month over month. And folks, we're talking about month over month. We're not even talking year over year. Gas is up 6.7%. Apparel up 0.8%. Meats, poultry, fish, eggs up 0.7%. We all know that that should be over 1%, but hence the cooking. Rent up 0.7%. Electricity up half a percentage point month over month. And it goes on and on and on. Now the categories that went down month over month, physician services down 0.1%, fruits and vegetables vegetables down half a percentage point, fuel oil down 1.2%, used cars down 2%, even though the most accurate, the industry standard, the Mannheim index shows that used cars prices went higher last month by 2.5%. But the cooks at the bureau say it went down 2%. Airline ticket fares down 2.1%. So again, you tell me, is inflation going down or up? Because when I look at different indicators, such as storage prices, when we look at the warehouse pricing index, sky high, making new highs. No problems here. Inflation continues to move higher. Now, the expense of warehousing, if prices continue to move higher, well, that has to be passed all the way down to the end consumer. That's inflationary. That's more inflation in the pipeline coming. And since we're talking about Valentine's Day, perhaps consumer spending on Valentine's is a leading indicator to retail sales, but most importantly, to the aggregate demand in the economy and the rebound in inflation. The headline reads, Inflation Can't Stop Cupid. Americans are spending almost 200 bucks a piece on Valentine's Day. And listen to this, $26 billion overall. But at least that's cheaper than divorce, isn't it? The National Retail Federation expects Americans to drop $25.9 billion around Valentine's Day, which is up from $23.9 billion last year. But that's the disinflation process, folks. One of the highest spending years on record. The NRF says Paramours will be paying more than $5.5 billion in jewelry. First of all, if your significant other is demanding $5.5 billion in jewelry, red flag, get the hell out. And almost $4.4 billion on a special evening out. Although, they might want to think twice before booking a Valentine's Day restaurant reservation. Because it sucks. That's why. Go the next day. Anyways, the annual Valentine's survey from the NRF, excuse me, and Prosper Insights and Analytics 
Analytics polled more than 7,600 U.S. adults consumers between January 3rd and 11th. It found that more than half, 52%, plan to celebrate the holiday this year, and they're planning to spend almost 200 bucks a piece, to be specific, 192.80 bucks a piece on average, which is up from 175.41 bucks last year, which also happens to be the second highest per person spending figure since the NRF and Prosper began tracking Valentine's Day shopping in 2004. Polling from Forbes Advisor also found that rising prices will not knock down Cupid's arrow. Listen to this. As despite inflation, 59% of respondents in the committed relationships said they plan to spend money on Valentine's Day this year. And almost 40% of Americans actually plan to spend more on the heart-themed holiday in 23 than they did last year. Good for them. The economy is doing fine. Everything is beautiful. The, the consumer is strong and resilient. The Maverick Wall Street doesn't know what he's talking about. We got a soft landing coming here, folks. Bye, 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 bye. However... But the darker side of all of that devotion is that a significant number, quote-unquote, of Americans told Forbes advisor that they have taken some serious financial measures, including going into debt to afford dates and romantic gifts over the past 12 months. Wow, love costs you a lot of money. Hope it's worth it. And it gets even worse, folks. Some 40% of survey respondents said that they had taken on credit card debt to lavish love on their significant others. Whoops. And 37% applied for a personal loan. Oh my god. What's going on here? And they're poised to do the same to cover the cost of Valentine's Day. Just swiping those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down, lavishing your uh, sugar baby. And after all of that lavishing, you get nothing. Total jerk off. A loser. Anyways, Heather Long says inflation is cooling off. Since we're talking about peak inflation, disinflation process, right? We're going down to 6.4% in January versus 9.1% in June. But we don't want to see progress stall. The tricky part is rent now accounts for half of the monthly increase. We expect that to fall. But when, she asks. And I say, how about never? You know why? Because the Fed's tightening of the monetary policy, it's not even tightening. When Zombie Harker says that we are at the restrictive rate and we're about to be done, buddy, you got another thing coming to you. Look at the correlation between the Chicago Fed National Financial Conditions Index and the Consumer Price Index. The only effective way to drive inflation down is to tighten financial conditions aggressively, just like uh, Volcker did back in the 80s. You see that zero line and the blue chart? That's financial conditions. Any reading above zero that means tightening of financial conditions. It means restrictive policy. Without being restrictive and tight, inflation will never go down. I promise you. It's going to keep rebounding and making higher highs. Absent of financial conditions tightening significantly. After all of what the Fed has done so far, financial conditions never even got tight. Financial conditions never even got above zero. And financial conditions are now actually loosening. You wonder why the CPI is making a comeback? Without crushing the aggregate demand, you will never beat inflation. Look at what's going on in the real estate market, for example. The moment interest rates move down, mortgage rates, the moment prices go down a tick, we see the stampede coming back. We talked about rents in Manhattan reaching all-time highs. And the mania continues. Sales of Brooklyn luxury homes over $10 million surged 333%. Now, you might say, hey, Maverick, but these are the rich. What about the poor and the middle class? How about the same? I don't know if you recall back in 2020-21 when folks were stampeding to buy homes, waiting in lines and open houses. You have cash offers, auctions in front of homes, outbidding each other, all cash payments. Now, if you would think that, as uh, imbecile Powell says, we have a disinflation process, and Zombie Harker, when he says we're close to being done and the rate is actually restrictive, you would think that this kind of mania will not come back that raising interest rates to almost 5% now done the magic. Folks are deterred from stampeding into buying homes. We have enough damage in the economy to push inflation down. But that's not the case, indicating that rates have to go higher, much higher. Take a look. Hi, Kelly. Yeah, we've been hearing some buzz from agents that things were suddenly getting busy again. So we hit an open house over the weekend just across the D.C. line in Bethesda, Maryland. The three-bedroom, two-bath home was just listed at about a million dollars, which the agent called a first-time buyer property. Property. Folks started arriving before the official start and just kept coming. The agent said she also has 40 appointments for private showings. Buyers are back. The agents are overwhelmed with phone calls, 
the sellers are just not ready. They think spring is later. Spring is right now. I actually thought, my God, this is amazing. Look at how fast it turned on a dime. We went from no showings and nobody coming to open houses that every single thing that I've launched in the last couple of weeks has had multiple offers. And mortgage applications to buy a home have been rising steadily. And Redfin reported that its demand index, which measures requests for house tours, just hit its highest level since September last week. I have a feeling like this kind of craziness about the market is not really going to get better in the near future. So I think there's no necessarily reason to wait. You just have to you just have to buy. I'm very surprised to see so many cash offers in the market. <laughs> I thought I would be at a much better position, but the competition is still there. This kind of jives with what we've noticed around town as well. Diana, stick around. Our next guest is also seeing some demand signs of firmness. New Black Knight data shows a 32% jump in mortgage rate lock volumes last month. That snaps a nine-month streak of declines. And again, the moment mortgage rates go down, purchases, refinance index, rebounding significantly higher. And with that will come more inflation. So when folks say, oh, rents are lagging, rents are going to go down. No, they're not. If the cooks at the bureau are looking at shelter inflation correctly, it should actually move higher from this point on. This is a disaster in the making. And you might say, what about the poor? Here's the poor for you. You got the city of Chicago, excuse me, the city of Chicago now spending $500 a month on uh, basic universal income. Now you might think, oh, these are poor folks. They, they're going to use the money to pay rent or bills or whatever. No, they're not. Haven't we learned anything from the stimmy mania? When you give the public free cash, they're going to splurge. And splurging causes more and more inflation. So when we talk about the soft landing, which is the last argument left, by the bulls, we talk about the bluff that if interest rates go really high, at some point they're going to break. They're going to realize that there is no soft landing and the only way to crush inflation is for the Fed to crush the economy, to produce more layoffs, significantly more. That is the only way now to crush this inflation. But there's a rate, there's a magic number, there is a reading in the dollar that will shock the stock market and bring it back into its senses. And that could happen as soon as tomorrow. What do we have tomorrow, Maverick? We have retail sales. The expectation Expectations are retail sales will crush expectations. We're going to have one of the highest readings we've had so far. If that is the case, if the splurging goes on in the economy again, this will translate into more and more inflation. And that means higher and higher rates by the Fed. Then the game becomes really, really dangerous. The Fed will have an objective to raise rates as much as they can to strike fear in the economy. And fear will not happen without significant damage. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of jobs lost lost, then inflation goes down for good. Once the market realizes that, the reckoning happens. In the meantime, we continue to live in la la land. And with that out of the way, let's move on to cover the stock market information for you. We begin with the closing of the indices today and uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing negative, down 156.66 points or a decline of 0.46%. The Nasdaq, on the other hand, closing positive by 68.36 points or a gain of 0.57%. The S&P in the red beat flattish, losing 1.16 points or a decline of 0.03%. We'll look at the sector performances today, leading the pack at number one, capturing the gold medal cyclicals. The reason is Tesla. Number two for the silver, technology. And the reason behind that, NVIDIA. Tesla and NVIDIA moving higher based on a gamma squeeze. And then we have number three for the bronze materials. Yet the laggards, the risk off segments, real estate, defensives, and utilities. We continue to yo-yo back and forth, back and forth between risk on, risk off, depending on the data, depending on the sentiment. But which sector continues to outperform regardless of the theme, be it risk on, risk off? The answer is energy. On to the breadth. NYSE, 45% advancing versus 52% declining. The NASDAQ, closing positive for the day, but look at this, 44% advancing versus, versus 53% declining. Declining, excuse me. And the reason behind that, the ad performance by Tesla, NVIDIA, and certain mega cap stocks. Moving on to commodities, what do we see here? The dollar was up, then it went down, then it went up again, then it went down, and therefore, all in all, the dollar was flattish. So the picture varies from negative 
the positive across the commodities cohort. We have certain commodities such as cocoa, coffee, copper, feeder cattle futures all moving higher. On the other hand, we have pullbacks, significant ones, in sugar, lumber, platinum, palladium, wheat, rough rice, all down for the day. But all eyes in the action really is in the energy commodities. We have a contrast. We talked about Russia striking back, cutting the output, and that pushed energy prices, but specifically oil, higher. Now we have the counterpunch, or the attempt of a counterpunch, by the Biden administration, aka the BlackRock administration, aka the Yale administration. And they counterpunch by depleting our already depleted natural resources. The Biden administration plans to sell more crude oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, with deliveries estimated to happen between April and June. Here we go, here we go. The problem is, the market is not stupid. The market sees this as a pathetic move. Yes, the WTI went down for a little bit, and then a rebound higher again. Because the market knows there is a limit. You can only deplete the SPR for so long, and then you gotta refill it. And since you guys love talking about, oh, the markets look ahead. If the markets are looking ahead, they're looking at a further depletion of the SPR, and that means more and more repurchases to refill the SPR. And therefore, I see this move as a positive catalyst, a tailwind for oil to move even higher. When it comes to natural gas, you might have noticed that natural gas was actually up by about 8% or so, a major pop. And I said on Friday, once this uh, genius, who's been long natural gas, surrendered and capitulated, saying that Vladimir Putin has lost the energy war. So I'm going to just call it off and, uh, and get my losses. And I'm going to blame it on Putin. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the moment when natural gas bottomed. And I said that on Friday. I said the bottom is here in natural gas. The moment the genius capitulated. And we bought Boyle, B-O-I-L, the ticker. We bought UNG. We bought Cotera, EQT, even the fertilizer names. We bought a basket of natural gas exposure. But of course, yesterday, natural gas futures went down by about 2% or so. And immediately, some of you said, hey, Maverick, you're wrong. There's no bottom in natural gas. And I say, folks, some of you, God love you. Because all what you can see is the uh, one second or maximum, the one minute it chart and you jerk off to that tick by tick. You have no longer horizon at all. You can't see anything beyond one minute. I'm looking at the weekly chart. It is way oversold. And last week, we saw a pop in volume with a positive closing. A classic sign for a bottom. Now, we can't know for sure, 100 million percent for sure, that this is the bottom. But we do have reliable indicators. On top of the technicals, we have the reopening of Freeport LNG. That is yet another catalyst because we're going to have demand back into U.S. natural gas. Now that we can actually produce and export more. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what do we see here? Frankly speaking, the casino is dead all in all, but we have two hot tables. Table number one leading the pack is Tesla, the souffle. Look at this. This is insane. Over 3 million contracts traded for the name today. That is the equivalent of 300 million shares in notional volume. More than the entire volume traded for the name today in actual stock. That's insanity. And of course, about 60% of those were calls. Now, this stock is being moved via gamma squeeze. This is a mechanical reason. And gamma squeezes have expiration dates because you hold these calls for so long and then you got the option either to exercise and own the stock or you get to close the position. Now, we know a lot of these people buying calls, they don't have the money to buy the underlying stock. And this is why they're buying calls. At some point, either they close or they exercise. We know they're not going to exercise. We know they're going to close. And we know the premiums are getting really, really elevated because the market maker is looking at the feedback and says, okay, we got a lot of demand here in Tesla calls. I'm going to jack up the premiums. When the market maker jacks up the premiums, even if the stock moves by 7.5% in a single day, you're not going to make a lot of money trading these call options. Once these uh, gamma squeezers, especially the Johnny Come Latelys, once they realize that it's not fun anymore. You're not scoring 300, 400, 500 percent trading Tesla calls. You're making barely 80 to 100 percent. Even as the stock pops by seven and a half percent, the gamma squeeze comes to an end. In a day like today with low volume, we see the gamma squeeze amplified. But we see a big move in the stock seven and a half percent. And of course, they're buying because Elon is pumping. Reverend Elon is promising new revelations in uh, March, I believe. So we do have an expiration date. And we do have the phenomenon of buy the rumor, sell the news. As a trader, would you know all of this information, it's a no-brainer 
then you're going to bet the other way. Now, the trick in succeeding in betting the other way depends on number one, the structure, the trade. Number two, the management of the trade. I'm going to produce my first options tutorial video for the members of this channel. In that video, we're going to talk about risk management and we're going to use Tesla as an example. Anyhow, here's a hot table number two for NVIDIA. Another gamma squeeze underway, a little smaller though, with the volume being about 1 million contracts traded today. But notice this, folks are actually betting the other way. About 52% of the volume was actually puts, not calls. Now we got the news after hours that uh, Warren Buffett is dumping TSM. That's Taiwan Semiconductor. A really weird move by the big buffet because usually he holds on into these positions for a little while. I have my own tinfoil hat theories, but who cares? But if we see all in all semiconductors down tomorrow, the assumption should be NVIDIA will go down actually leading the way to the downside. At number three, we have Apple with around 800,000 contracts traded today. About 52% of those were calls. Now, unlike Tesla, the premiums for Apple are really cheap. So if you're going to bet one way or the other on a pop or a big crash, use Apple, not Tesla, because the premiums for Apple are really cheap. Tesla, way too high. On to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We begin with the ticker HAL Halliburton. Now, the name is down big after earnings, but my take is that this is an overreaction. And we will see HAL rebounding in no time. Now, here's somebody who agrees with me, and they bought the 40 fee calls for the expiration date, April 21st, with expectations that the name is going to rebound and gain more than 10% by the expiration date. They paid around one buck and 30 cents a piece. Danner, this trade all in all spending around one and a half million dollars. Now I'm going to skip the XOP, even though it's highlighted for some reason. I don't know why. We're going to go to Tesla, TSLA, and somebody's buying calls, betting that the gamma squeeze will continue to go for a little more. And they bought the 227 and a half calls for the expiration date, February 24th, with expectations that Tesla could add gains worth at least 9% or so by the expiration date. They paid around three bucks and 60 cents a piece tenor. This trade all in all spending around half a million dollars. On to the heat map. What do we see here? Any theme? The answer is not quite. We have weakness across the board, be it with some uh, risk on segments outperforming, be it chips, software names, Tesla, of course, some of the reopening names, Expedia, Bookings.com, some of the hotels on the heels of Marriott's earnings, for example. But besides that, we don't have a theme one way or the other. It's all over the place, lots of earnings plays. Yet when we talk about energy and how it continues to outperform, be it in a risk on or risk off theme, it doesn't matter. We also see a contrast between Chevron and Exxon. Recently, Exxon has been outperforming, but I've been saying the opportunity is in buying Chevron, not chasing the rally in Exxon. Now we see Chevron outperforming Exxon. My hunch is this will continue for a little while. Now let's talk about certain corporate news, and we begin with the tsunami of layoffs, this time around across the Atlantic and Europe, be it from an American company called Ford. And the company is laying off about 3,800 jobs, mostly in Germany. And the reason is the shift to EVs. The gift that keep on giving. And when it rains, it pours for Ford because we got the news that the company is halting the production and shipment of the F-150 Lightning. And this is due to a potential battery issue, which could explode your garage or the highway. And it could take uh, thousands of gallons of water to put down. Anyways, we also have the AI mania. All what a company has to say is we are an AI company. And boom, the stock blasts higher big time. Case in point, Palantir today. So you got a company like Waste Management, for example. It's a trash company. I'm not saying this in a disparaging way. It is actually a trash company. But the stock is down big since the last report. So maybe Waste Management should say, we are an AI company too. Boom, the stock shoots up higher. JP Morgan, it's an AI company. AMC, want to get the mother of all squeezes? Let's say it's an AI company too. Bed Bath & Beyond, everybody's an AI company. You are an AI, he's an AI, everybody's an AI. Yet the father of the internet warns, don't rush the investment into AI just because Chad GPT is really cool. But what does he know, right? He's just a jealous boomer. On to the heat map for the ETFs. What do we see here? Weakness across the board, the exception being chips, SMH, SOX, and the reason is we have NVIDIA AMD blasting higher. The XLK catching a bit, a little bit. The XLY, this is cyclicals due to Tesla. And then we have the XME also outperforming, mostly due to copper companies such as Freeport McMoran. But my hunch is that's not going to last either. Growth at performing value today when in a day where chips 
leading the pack. The problem is, when the dollar is not moving one way or the other, it's up for grabs. But when the dollar starts to move one way or the other, we're going to see all of these ETFs moving accordingly. Now, the notable ad performer comes from Natural Gas, the ticker UNG, and your favorite, of course, BOIL. A lot of you love to trade that one. The name closed with gains almost worth about 9%. And if we continue to see short covering in Natural Gas, UNG and BOIL will continue to outperform. But understand this, if you buy either one of these two, you gotta close fast, specifically if you're trading call options on these, because they move erratically, they reset every single day, and if you're holding calls for a prolonged period of time, you could be up big one day and then down the other. So make sure that you book your profits right away, and then move some of these profits if you still believe in natural gas into a more sustainable bit, such as buying a natural gas stock, be it Cotera, be it uh, EQT, SWN, you got a lot of them. You can also buy uh, fertilizer stocks and the name Mosaic, the ticker MOS comes to mind. You can also buy the futures if you want, but I know a lot of you are buying BOIL. My advice is you make big money quick and fast, make sure that you take some profits out of this trade and rotate them into a more sustainable trade. It's the same thing when you buy the T triple Qs, for example, and it pops big time. You take these profits and then you buy something like Apple, AMD, if you still believe that the rally is going to continue. Anyhow, moving on to charts, and we begin with the SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? It is above 410. That's the good news. The bad news is it is having a hard time making a higher high. Now, the bears would look at this as, look, we have negative divergence in the 30. We look at the RSI. We also have a reversal candle. So despite the rebounds, this could be a reverse ABC pattern. Down we go, losing 410, and maybe all the way down to 405. The bulls will counter and say, wait a minute here. What if this is a cup and handed formation? We made a higher low. Next thing you know, we make a higher high, and the chart trades above 416 once and for all. Maybe it goes all the way up to 420. To settle the argument, we have to look at the daily chart. We're using the futures contract, the daily chart. What do we see here for the SPY? Number one, the volume moves moved significantly higher today. Not a good sign for the bulls. Also, the RSI is no longer in positive divergence. It's actually in negative divergence again. The MACD indicator is topping on its uh, bullish momentum, and it's now crossing, producing red impressions on the histogram, indicating bearish momentum underway. You put it all together, and the consensus becomes, while the chart is still trading within range, 4,100 is support, 4,180 as resistance, more likely than not, the chart will break 4,100 as support, and then it goes down all the way to 4037 as the next support. Yet when we look at it from the SPX perspective, the cash index, and this is a daily chart, we've been eyeing the gap at 4,228 and a half. This is a major gap, and we know the charts love to fill the gaps above. Could this be a bull flag consolidation pattern? If it breaks out, higher we go, closing the gap, and then we go down. And frankly speaking, this is what I prefer, so we can end the conversation about what about the gaps above? What about the gaps above? They're now closed, we don't have to talk about them anymore. What about the queues? 30 minutes. What do we see here? A similar story with the SPY. One important support line, that is 372, was recaptured the support again, and it was retested. Now, the problem with this chart is, the bears would argue, what if this is a double top formation? And then down we go, and if this time 372 is broken again, that would be the final break, and down we go to 294.33. And that would be considered a reversal. Now, the bulls would say not so fast. We've done a retest to 372. So far, so good. What if this is a formation of an ABC pattern, and the C leg will take us all the way above 308.55? Now, both sides have a valid argument, so we have to look at the daily chart to see who has the better one. This is a daily chart for the continuous contract for the queues. What do we see here? Negative divergence on the RSI. Negative momentum starting in the MACD indicator, confirming that we're losing momentum. We're running out of gas here. Now, the trading remains in range with the support being 12,207 and the resistance being 12,766. The volume went higher today. Not a good sign for the bulls. When the volume comes back, more activities by the human beings. The algos start to go back in the shadows. And when the human being interferes after a big rally like we've been seeing year to date, they're going to interfere to book profits, not to hop in and open more positions. That was the job of the algos. So if we clean it up and uh, we remove all of these indicators and lines, could this be a reverse ABC pattern in the making? That indeed could be the case. What about the IWM, the Russell 2000? 30 minutes chart, what do we see here? Again, recapturing an important support line, 191.5. The question becomes, is it going to hold onto 191.5 support? We know we have uh, negative divergence in the RSI, indicating weakness in the momentum. So 
So this could be a reverse ABC pattern. If the support of 191.5 is lost again, then we go to 188. And perhaps the most important chart to watch is the dollar. The Dixie keeps holding on to 103 as support over and over and over and over again. It is consolidating in a bull flag pattern. It wants to pop higher, but it's looking for the fuel. It's looking for the spark to ignite the fuel, I should say. Now, the CPI failed to do the job today. The question becomes, could retail sales do the job? Something to watch for. If that is the case, what happens to gold? The chart remains in a bear flag consolidation pattern and we have to look at 1842 and then take it from there if we get a rebound and the dollar loses momentum then we're talking if not then 1842 is not going to hold and down we go to another support line below but we'll take it one step at a time what about brent oil what do we see here holding on to 85 a really important number here brent got to hold on 85 and it got to trade above 85 as soon as possible because it needs to make a higher high in the pattern otherwise if it fails and it goes back toward the trend line once again the likelihood is it's not going to hold and down we go to 77 but so long as 85 holds the support, this could be a bull flag consolidation pattern. And once it plays out, we see Brent at the 90s in no time. What about the 10-year yield? What do we see here? We talked about 3.8 being in the bag. We got that today, but the momentum is not over yet. If we get hotter retail sales data, we could go all the way to 4. Matter of fact, I would say four becomes the consensus now. Most importantly, we have to look at the two year because this is the most accurate indicator to what the Fed is going to do. It is now breaking out out of the consolidation range. The bull flag is playing out and I got 5.24% as the next stop. If that is the case, we go back to the highs from November. Notice that the moment the two year topped in November and started moving down, that was the bottom in the equities market. If we're going to go back to the November highs in the two year yield, shouldn't the equities market go down? to the November lows? Something to think about. For now, we talked about the divorce between bonds and equities, but that's not going to last for too long. TLT, what's going on here in the daily chart? Holding on to 103.5 as support. Likelihood is not going to hold. And down we go to 100. Maybe that's going to hold, but we'll take it one day at a time. VIX, four hours. What do we see here? Lost 20 as support, which by the way, gives you cheaper options, specifically in puts. And we talked about this in Discord. We have expiration tomorrow for options in the VIX. And the market maker of course wants to exercise maximum pain the maximum pain number that ensures that the majority of call and put options expire worthless is the number 17 now it's really hard to go all the way down to 17 so right now 19 18 that's good enough to induce maximum pain tomorrow once max pain is over my hunch is when the new contract is in play the vix is going to rebound higher again apple the big kahuna 30 minutes what do we see here still having a hard time cracking above the resistance of the gap it gave it a shot once, twice, third time, fourth time, not happening. At some point, it's going to run out of momentum. If the buyers are not showing up, the sellers are gonna. If that is the case, 150 is going to be broken. And after 150 comes 145. And therefore, my play for now is holding the Marsh 145 puts. If we get there really fast, then we'll talk about rolling all the way to April or maybe June. But the question becomes, what if it doesn't play out? What if Apple holds on to 150 as support for a little while? Therefore, we're going with the shorter expiration in April and, excuse me, March not April, June, because we're going to have a confirmation first. We got to see 150 lost the support. And we get a daily closing below 150. Then we got a confirmation to double down, to go longer, whatever you want. But 150 has to be lost first. Tesla, the souffle, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? The Johnny come lately to the gamma squeeze. They want to squeeze the last bit of juice of this trade. The number becomes 214. If they get above 214, then it becomes a problem for somebody holding puts like me. But so long as they fail to get above 214, 14. Or better yet, if they lose support at 200.82 or 194.55. That would be a signal to triple down, double down, quadruple down, doesn't matter. If you're not in the trade, you're going to get into it. Because these gamma squeezes, when they frizzle out, they produce massive flush downs. For now, we know that the premiums are getting really expensive. We know that the average side of the 30 is getting really elevated. We know that the volume is going down. So there is no organic buying here. It all depends on somebody holding the stock saying, okay, this is good enough. Let's pull the trigger and book some profits here. Then we see the gamma squeeze flushing down big time. You know, we got Soros who bought Tesla at the bottom. Now he's sitting on massive profits. Could Soros say, okay, I don't like Elon Musk anymore. I decided not to like him all of a sudden. Now that Tesla is at 200. I used to like Elon when Tesla was at 100, but at 200, mm, don't like Elon anymore. He decides to dump, boom, it's over. Last but not least, Bitcoin, a daily chart. What do we have here? A little rebound today, but it doesn't change anything at all. RSI in negative momentum. So is the MACD 23,189. A close above the 
they're more out of the woods. Other than that, the, the ultimate destination becomes 20,593.34. We test that and see what happens. Moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? A lot of stuff. The most important one is retail sales. Then we have the Empire State Manufacturing Index. We have the Industrial Production Index, Capacity Utilization Rate, the Home Builders Index, along with business inventories. A slew of macroeconomics data, watch the dollar. If it starts to break out, if it gets to 104, 105, the equities market is not going to hold. Because it's one thing when yields go higher, you can ignore that. You can say, okay, yields are going higher because we have a soft landing happening in the economy. Valuations are still too low. We don't need to be aggressive right now, even though yields are moving higher. But when the dollar moves higher, you can't brush that off because that has a tangible impact on corporate margins. So keep that in mind. But with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And now we'll talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. I don't need all that. Just bring me flowers sometime.